So we are creating games written in Haskell, running on Android, iOS, and desktop. And here you see six of our games. And we think Haskell is a cool language to write games, but only if you manage certain challenges. And about three of our challenges I want to talk about today and how we approach them and what we are doing to overcome these challenges. So what you see here is that we have a lot of I.O. that we have to deal with. We have animations, we have different input devices like um, mouse events, keyboard events, touch events, Vmode Connect. And we even need to know which screen orientation we are running on. And this can change during the game. We also have to render many, many things. So you might wonder whether we are going into I.O. We touch it and we just stick there. So whether we are just writing one block of I.O. code. But no, we are not. We are writing real, pure code. And how we are doing it is one point what I want to give an idea to you today. A second challenge that we have is related to maintainability. So right now we have more than six games, six you can see here. But we want to have more. And the question is, how can we get more? So it's very important to have a good structure. So the first thing is we want the structure that probably can build up all of our games. So if you know one of our games, you already know all of our games. And there are only minimal parts of game-specific parts in there where you have to focus when you're writing one game on its own. But you can even share a lot of code um, using libraries. So this is one part. The second part is that we want to write compositional code. This means that, for example, the main menu does not even know about the ga um, game itself, so the game state. And for example, the level loading screen does not need to know anything about the game finished screen. And if you're writing a game like this, then you can focus on the parts that you want to figure out something about in the moment that you need to. So you can really focus and don't need to think about, oh, what's going on in the rest of the game. I don't care at this moment. I can really focus on what I need to do. So the second question is, how can we get such a compositional structure? And our third challenge is related to the input, backend, and platform. So as I already said, we have different inputs. We also have different backends. For example, SDL, SDL1, 2, so SDL is the simple direct media library. We're also running on different platforms, Android, I.O., desktop. And while I'm creating a game, I really don't want to care about this. This is something compilation should do, but I don't want to care about it. While I'm creating the game on its own, I don't want to think about this. And how we are doing this, I also want to try to give you an idea what's going on there. So here you see three of our challenges, and let's start with the first one. This is some code how we rendered before we had our new structure. So you see here, we want to render a ball, or we want to paint a ball, and we are getting some resources over here. This is something like what we already loaded, some images from a path. Then we have a surface. This tells us that we, uh, this code is written for SDL1. And we get some information about the object itself. And then we need to figure out something about the position, the size, getting the image itself. And then we can render it, which is SDL related right now. But this code is sub-ideal. What happens if we want to use HTML instead of SDL? Which lines would we need to change? So, Ball, but ball size. <laughs> not exactly that hard it is, but at least this size um, parts are, uh, down there where we have SDL, this definitely needs to change. What happens if we want to transform all of our um, stuff that we want to render? For example, if we think about, oh, now I want a menu bar on the side, then I need to move everything around. What do I need to change? So one idea could be that we are adding a displacement variable at the beginning, and we are just adding it up here to our position. This is one option. There are many options. 
If we not only have a paint ball, but also a paint ball, we need to add this to every hour function. And the third point is, this is the rendering. What happens if the logic also want to know where the ball was, so that we can see whether someone was clicking on the ball? Then we need to recalculate what's going on over there. So this part needs to be found in the logic part as well. If you are adding displacement, then we would also recalculate this part as well. And that's a really big issue, because then we need to du duplicate code. So these are three problems that we have, and now I want to give you an idea how we get rid of them. So starting with the back end, what we are doing is we are creating our own image specification. And there we give everything that all of our backends would need. So here it's a path, and the nothing stands for um, uh, alpha channel mask that the PNG could have. If it does not have, it's just a nothing. And what we are doing here, we are then adding a resource ID, and with this ID, we can match and map to this um, image specification. So in our games, we are just talking about these resource IDs. And our backend packages do some rendering with the render environment for each package. Somehow with the resource ID, here's a position where to render it, and then this do, does the I.O. So what we could here do now is additionally creating a collage, and then we have the hidden structure outside. So right now we're getting the first part of the rendering we have in here. So we know the resource ID, which was related to the image that we want to render, and the position. And now we have this part also obviously here, and we can use it. And sometimes you don't have only images, but you want also to add visual texts or some rectangles. So we have an even more sophisticated element, which is visual element, where we can um, have filled rectangle. For example, here we have the color ID plus the size and the visual text, which has the font ID, a color ID, and then the text mes message itself. And since collages are monoids, we can just put them all together. And then we can render this with our backend. So now, we don't have to think about the backend anymore while we are creating our game. We can do some transformation over all of our collages at the same time. And then still is the question about the hidden structure. We have some information here already, the position. But if we need more information for the logic, we are adding widgets. So we are getting an ID additionally and a size. And with this information, we can go in the logic without I.O. Here is no I.O. in the collage, there is no I.O. And can just get the information that we need. And that's for us pretty cool to have like this. And what this means is just that we have a rendering which has two steps. We have the collage where we just create everything that we want to render. And then the backend package says, okay, now we are rendering in the real world. The problem here is that the widget size is not always known, especially for visual texts. In SDL and SDL2, you need to render to get the uh, text size, because we're getting it from a for, uh, foreign function interface, and there we're just getting it in I.O. And this is right now a problem that we have. You probably can argument that if you can use unsafe perform I.O., but it's not the only function that we need there, and we're always getting into this, into this problem at this point. So this is still a question how to handle this this point. So we saw now how we get our functions and our games pure. So in our games itself, we don't have the I.O. anymore. It's just the rendering which is done in the package. So now let's go to our compositional structure. Imagine that these two are two games that you have. The blue, whitish parts here is game specific, 
here are the lighter ones are game specific, the green ones, so these are shared code. So it's a package that you're using. And suppose that someone tells you, here is a bug. You start to fix it, and then you're thinking, well, is it also in this game? So you're searching, where is it? Hmm, probably here. Oh, I implemented it in a different way. Oh, now I need a new solution to find to do it. This is something we really don't want to have. What we try to do is have the same structure and find as much as possible shared code. And what we are doing here is what I really, really like. So every game has something like sensing, updating, and rendering. This is a common structure for games. And what we did, forget about the sensing for a moment, and then we got this structure. Logic is the updating, output is the rendering. We're doing this in the main function, and then we're going to the application, and we're talking to the whole application. And the application knows that there is a menu, sub-application, and a game application. And the application just knows, okay, we are right in a menu state or in a game state. And given from this, it just says, I don't know what to do. Yeah, it's a menu state, go here. And it just says, I'm dispatching to this part. And the menu itself has the same structure. It knows about the main menu, about menu, level selection menu, and it just says, I'll be right now in the ma main menu um, status, let's go here. And the main menu can probably um, figure out some preferences that you can change, um, then it's doing it on its own. But if it does not know how to go on, because for example the button for go into the level selection menu is pressed, then it just gives the information up here, and this one says, okay, now we're going here. If it does not know how to handle it, it's going up to the application. For example, if we say, play the game. Menu does not know how this works. It does not know anything about the game. So it just says, application, please handle it. And the application says, yep, yeah, I know where to go. You're going here. So it's basically just in dispatching. So the middle ones are basically the same. They have the same structure. There's basically the same function in there. And also here, down here, they are more or less the same. We have right now two questions here. So the sensing, I said forget about it. We are right now using a global controller because it made sense and it was easier to implement for the beginning. And therefore we had a global um, controller, but probably it would be better to have a compositional structure where each sub-application has its own controller. And especially if you think that we have a game where you say, okay, if the user goes to the right, you want to go to the left. You could get, uh, invent such a game. You probably don't want to have the same effect in the menu. So maybe it makes sense to have a local controller for each part. And there it's not a big deal, we just haven't done it yet. But we could do it. The bigger problem is the resource manager. Resource manager in our case is also global. And that has the following reason. So every game has a style. If you have, for example, a back button in the menu, it should have the same style as this one. If you put the resources on a local part, so on this part, on this part, you need to duplicate it. You need the same fonts, the same colors, the same image, but you have to duplicate them. And we're right now not, we haven't, haven't found now uh, we haven't found yet a way to merge them together to um, figure out how not to duplicate them. So this is also an open question that we have right now. Now to the shared parts. So what we really want, we have now a no nice structure, we want to have a lot of shared code. And for this we created Fawn. This is our game and application library. And there we have different parts. So we have rendering in resource management, which you already saw. We have the collages, visual elements, the rendering parts, mainly for SDL, SDL1, and SDL2. A little bit of HTML is there, but basically I'm working right now with SDL1 and 2. We also have some settings, 
um, which are handled differently in Android and iOS, preference handling, and we have um, something like a menu system, a physics system, so this is kind of stuff that we have there. And what we're trying to do is to use as many shared code in our apps so that the game-specific parts, so the purple or light blue parts, are getting minimal. And sometimes it's not possible to use packages, so we are thinking about how to use templates so that we have always the same names there, so the module names are the same, so that we just can use templates. And this is basically what we are doing there. And here's some evaluation. First game is Magic Cookie. This was our first game that we created. And before we used Farm there, we had 2,400 lines of code. A lot of code in Farm right now is coming from Magic Cookies because it was the inspiring part where we got our ideas. And when we introduced Form in Magic Cookie, it has only 990 lines of code. And the core is 400 lines of code. What means core? We're removing everything which is just mapping of, for example, the resource IDs with the path, because this is nothing you have to deal with when you really want to think about the game. The levels um, description. This is something you don't need to think about it as a whole bunch of things that, uh, that you have to have had in your mind uh, by reasoning about the game. And what we are seeing, seeing is that the alignment of visual element is still a huge bunch of code that is in our games within these 400 lines of code. So if the alignment is not the problem of your game, it's still getting smaller. Our second game, it's close to release, is m -Puzzle. Right now it has over 2,800 lines of code, and the core is less of 1,600 lines of code. Why is this so huge? So the difference is huge because here we have a lot of blocks in different columns, different shapes, in different sizes. And this is just a huge bunch of um, um, mapping which is going on there. And the levels description, it's um, 50 levels and it's also a huge bunch of just descriptions. It's also, we are not using fawn in the whole um, game yet. So there's a different menu system in there. It was to try which one is better. And now we are trying to merge the one and the other. And also the controller is different. So we have one game controller that we already have in Fawn, but we, this is not yet in my game. So right now we are on the stage that we're saying, okay, let's see how we can get this into Fawn or whether we can just use the other one. It's a little bit of experimental code to see what's going on. And what we see in M Puzzled, this is the second game, is over 630 lines of code from the core is also just alignment. So a big problem that we have right now is how to get some auxiliary functions for alignment. This is the next step where we want to go. So what you saw is we have purity. We really want pure games. And our problem is the size of visual elements. And we have our composition application architecture where, where we're thinking about global and versus, uh, lo versus local controller and resource management and the alignment of visual elements. This is what I talked about today. And in our paper, you find a little bit more. So we touched a little bit the abstraction from backend and platform. If you want, I can show you more about this. I have some slides for this as well. There is more in the paper about form. So better description <laughs> what we did there. And we're describing six and a little bit more <coughs> games that we created. And with this, we try to evaluate our approach and how it affects our games. So that's what is in the paper. And if you want to know more about it, you can read the paper or just reach out to us. Thank you. Additional um, five minutes if you want to show the extra Good. things, and then we'll still have uh, five minutes for questions after that. Perfect. So, the abstraction from backend and platform. There we have two approaches. And the idea to come back is okay, we have different imports inputs keyboard, connect, mouse, touch, and V mode. 
backend can be Windows, Linux, iOS, Android, so we do a lot of them. SDL1, SDL2, and HTML for platform. So, and while I'm creating my game, I really don't want to care about this. That's the important point. So, what we are doing is the following. We give the name, here is for SDL, for both of the SDLs, to make it clear. We give them the same name and the same module name. And then we have the image specification and with this, in both packages with the same name, um, you don't need to care. And while we are compiling, we just say, okay, I need the resource management from one or the other. And since they have the same name, I can just pick it while I'm compiling, and within the game I don't need to care about it. So this is one approach. We have a second one. In our modules in form, we can also have a CPP flags, and within them, and we have in one module, the Android way to do it, the iOS way to do it, or the desktop way to do it, but it's in our form model, so then we just also need to compile with the right flex. And both approaches have pro and cons. This is sometimes hard to read, for example, but sometimes it's better to have everything in one module to see what's going on. Otherwise, you need to check with different modules. So both parts have pro and cons. Um, we're doing this approach for most of the stuff. We have some non-standard input devices, so vMode and Kinect is still a little bit different. So there we are doing a little bit of different stuff. Um, some devices need back buttons and some not. So Android has a back button, iOS does not have a back button, so you need to add this. And this is something that we are doing in the game, because we need to uh, put it on a different position uh, related to yeah, the style of the game. And the main function of the Haskell module needs to be different in iOS and Android for compiling. <laughs> it's just something that's something that we're doing manually. So, and still the open question is which one is the better approach of these two, but yeah, that will come up out during the time. So, this is the part for the backend. I'm ready. Um, questions? Are you, um, how do you um, compile for your mobile targets? Do you build compilers? Do you build GAC for the targets and then you, you know, go through the pain of actually you know, compiling your, your programs on those targets? Or do you cross compile from x86 to uh, modern system? <coughs> so basically, I don't know much about it because I'm creating games in Haskell. And I have a tool for doing it for Android, so I'm creating only the um, Haskell code. I'm testing it on my computer on Haskell with the desktop part. And then I have two tools. One is Andronaut, and the other one is Curiosity, which is our stuff from Kira. <laughs> and I'm compiling with it, and I don't know anything about it. So <laughs> I can't tell you. We're doing it only in pure Haskell code, but I'm not 100% sure. So I'm only doing it in Haskell, but probably there's some binding behind that I just normally not take a look at. Um, do you think this programming model influences the style of gameplay that you create? Are there certain mm -hmm. kinds of games that you're more likely to arrive at because of this, or is it independent? So the, the game structure <laughs> that we created. I don't know, I don't see it yet. Let me show, let's go to the first, um, just to this. Because, so we have two board games right now. And all of these games have the same structure right now. So this is Haskinoid, which is probably no. Um, and this is a different kind of game, I would say. So I, I don't see, so what you have is something like a game uh, playing and this module probably is different, but the whole structure 
that we have something like the game is loading, the level is loading, the game is finished. I think there is not that much of a difference. So the model of game playing might be different. Right. And, but there also, for the rendering, for example, you will create a collage. The question is how this collage looks like. And there's one or two functions that probably are different. But the whole structure right now, it works pretty well. But we need to see what's happening in the future. Yeah, yeah. Uh, have you considered why like, compile to React from Haskell to React? Because as far as I know, you can like run React to, to generate what uh, games or apps for Android and uh, iOS and web. So maybe it would like put a lot of your work mm -hmm. just to compile to one thing that can compile to many other. So React, as far as I know, is also FRP. Uh, library, right? Yeah. yeah, kind of. Okay, we are using Yampa, and what we want to do next is to go into Dunai. So we didn't thought about it, but I will discuss it with my boss, and let's see how this works. So thank you.